Good evening. This is Chairwoman Julie Hen. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, October 25th, 2022. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Roa Hassan. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the October 25th agenda. Dr. Yarbrough, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am unaware of any additions or changes to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And nine, to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chairman McMillian, Dr. Yarborough, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibits D1 through D4? So move, Stolaski. Do I have a second? Second, Causey. Any discussion? Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Causey. Uh, may we have just a moment to acknowledge the work of the human resources that continues uh, to add staff members in critical positions for the school system? Yes, thank you for that acknowledgement, Mrs. Causey. And thank you to our, our HR staff. We, thank you. We definitely appreciate all of your efforts. That <laughs> may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jaleski? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Yarborough. Thank you. Madam Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board, I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. One, safety manager, office of school safety, and two, supervisor solutions implementation systems management, office of technology solutions. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in exhibit E1? So moved, Ms. Causey. Second, Hassan. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jaleski? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Yarbrough? Yes, thank you. Our two board appointees are watching virtually this evening. First appointment is Donald Bridges. His previous experience is police officer for Baltimore County, specifically school resource officer. He served in the Baltimore County Police Department for 30 years 
and 25 years as an <coughs> SRO to position of safety manager, Office of School Safety. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you. Our final appointment for this evening is Nicholas Fioravanti from Cloud Applications Engineer at the Office of Technology Solutions Support to Supervisor Solutions Implementation System Management, Office of Technology Solutions Support. His background includes Cloud Applications Engineer, a contractor for Cavera LLC, contractor for Space Telescope Science Institute, Performance Solutions, and Management Concepts. Congratulations to Mr. for your event. Yes, congratulations to them both. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who register to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education, Participation by the Public. I now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. And our first speaker, our first speaker is Billy Burke with CASE. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Mrs. Hen, Vice Chair Mr. McMillian, Deputy Superintendent Dr. Yarborough, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on behalf of CASE. I had two meetings over the past week with the CASE general membership. We met to discuss the compensation package and to identify issues that keep CASE members from operating at high efficiency. First, let me thank the board and staff again for the compensation package. There are still ways to improve morale with hiring and retention regarding workload, but the compensation package is greatly appreciated. Tonight I'd like to concentrate my comments on support for special education programs and the students that receive special education services. As you begin to create the next budget, please try to restore the IEP facilitators. With properly trained IEP facilitators, BCPS could greatly reduce non-public placements and its substantial costs. IEP facilitators can better collaborate with family advocates and lawyers based on the singular focus of their job. When this work falls to assistant principals, there is an opportunity cost. If an assistant principal has a regional special education program in their building, they are holding team meetings at least two days a week. This reduces the time they spend observing lessons and providing feedback for teacher growth, and it causes them to be less available to respond to behavior and transportation issues, not to mention testing, lunch duty, and bus duty. One significant impact of the staffing shortage on special education is that students may not receive 
the services on their IEPs. Last summer, schools were individually tasked with managing compensatory services. That makes sense because schools best know the students and their needs, but it only works if you're fully staffed. And if you're fully staffed, you won't need compensatory services. Some schools couldn't find teachers that were willing to do the extra work, even when offered a stipend. At some point, people are too exhausted and the stipend is no longer enough of an incentive. It's about work-life balance. So the work fell again to the assistant principal. The administrator provided the special education services. That administrator may or may not have needed, had the needed training to provide those services. If I have three teacher openings in my special education programs and my students qualify for compensatory services, nothing magical happens that I can now fill those openings for the summer. <clears throat> Excuse me. I need a systemic approach and a systemic plan to solve the compensatory uh, needs for the summer. Thank you for the opportunity for speaking on behalf of CASE. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marlena Purcell. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Hello, Madam Chair, Vice President Chair, members of the board, Dr. Yarborough. <laughs> I am Marlena Colleton Purcell. I'm the Southwest Area Educational Advisory Council um, Chair. And I just wanted to take a moment tonight to be able to come for you, um, come before you with the fiscal year 2024 budget request. So let me first back up by saying, um, let's give a great big cheer. I wasn't there, but I so heartily um, received the ribbon cutting for Lansdowne High School. It is a great pleasure to know all the labor that has been put in by community stakeholders um, ha happened to see that day, um, all of their work and their strive. So thank you, board members, and thank you, community. <laughs> Yay, Lansdowne. Next. <laughs> I would like to um, present a consideration um, specifically for two schools, Southwest Academy and Featherbed, specifically for the interest and exit of the um, uh, cars going in and out of that entrance for parents dropping off um, for a consideration for the board and Dr. Williams' team to look at um, a better way for flow um, in the budget, that is. And I just wanted to also reiterate what was already put in request. I want to speak it into existence for Woodmore Elementary School for the intercom replacement, Harethorpe, um, Harethorpe for the mechanical system upgrade, the Winchester for um, mechanical system, Winfield, and Woodbridge, number 33 on your list. I just wanted to make a plea for Woodbridge specifically to maybe um, not only bump up at a 50% of a farm's rate, but also to know that um, open space is just not the way to go. And, and that school is in desperate need. Um, and I know the principal very well, Ms. Phelps will be graciously to consider anyone on the board member to go there for um, a visit. Okay, my remaining time, I just wanted to make a public announcement that Wednesday, tomorrow, um, there is a forum sponsored and co-sponsored by the PTA as well as the area council chairs um, for a board forum that is um, upcoming board members. So please come out, parents, community stakeholders, all are welcome. It is on Zoom and you can find that information if you have not done so already, you can find the information online by visiting the BCPS and clicking on the area council um, website. And then the Southwest will be meeting the second uh, Monday, and that's in November. So please make sure you save the date. It is a joint meeting. It is going to be with Northwest, and we welcome each and every one of you to come. We're going to be having the, well, speaking on the topic of academic excellence. So come on out. Report cards will be home or by that time, hopefully. If not, you already know your grades. Thank you. Thank you. Our next stakeholder speaker is Ms. Cindy Sexton with TAPCO. Good evening, Chair Han, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Yarborough, and members of the board. 
My comments at the last board meeting on October 11 have been misquoted in the media and on social media. I'm here tonight to be sure that my message is clear so that those who have misquoted me hear again my accurate remarks and can correct the narrative. My exact words were, as I visit schools, there are many places where discipline is under control and students are where they belong, in their classes and not in the hall at inappropriate times. That is great and I commend those administrators, educators and staff for working to make this happen. Keep up the good work. There are others though that are still struggling and I ask that we provide the support and resources they need so our teachers can teach and our students can learn. I did not say, as is being reported and retold incorrectly, that everything is fine in our schools. I know there are fights, aggressive behavior and more. Before I was elected to role of president, I was one of the original members of the TABCO Discipline Action Working Group. We worked then, as we do now, with BCPS leadership to address discipline concerns and find solutions. We worked with Mr. Offerman to get a cell phone policy in place. We worked to have a template of a school discipline plan so every school did not have to create one from scratch. We worked so every school's plan, frequently referred to as the positive behavior plan, is on the school website so it is accessible to students and the community. As I said, I know there are problems and resources and support have been and will continue to be provided to those schools. Even one fight, one hurt student or staff member is too many. This is a deeply personal issue and concern for me and one I take extremely seriously. In my 18 years as librarian at Villa Cresta, I was fortunate not to have been injured. My mother, however, was not so lucky. In 1991, she was breaking up a fight in her fifth grade classroom at a BCPS school and was so injured she had to go out on permanent disability retirement. Those injuries still plague her today and she had to leave her beloved profession well before she wanted to. So I get it. And as I said two weeks ago, a safe learning environment must be provided. Let's continue to work to ensure that safety is the priority at every school and work site. Our number one job is to keep students and staff safe because if they aren't safe, they won't learn. They won't learn. So feel free to quote me, but get it right. Thank you. Thank you. Next is general public comment and our first speaker is Amy Adams. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm here to speak again on two topics, safety and academics. Dr. Williams, um, the virtual town hall was less than impactful, in my opinion. It was very scripted and lightly attended. Only 300 parents out of a system of 111,000 students is not a successful event. Also, those of us in attendance are most likely your engaged parents. We are your volunteers, your donors. We are your support in the homes. Your message to us needs to be one of acknowledgement, not dismissal. We're coming to you for help because we are legitimately concerned and want solutions. Your message seems to be that your hands are tied by law and Comar and the current practices are good enough. But something isn't working when we can watch videos from schools around the county of children beating each other up and stomping on each other's heads. When children are injured so severely at school, they go to the hospital. What can be done within the current laws and regulations? What are you, the school admins, and the Board of Education going to do to lobby for a revision of current laws and regulations? That's what we want to hear. What good is the legislative and governmental committee if you don't address this issue? What good are the annual legislative priorities if our schools aren't safe enough to protect the kids, which contributes to our kids' academic declines year after year? Families and teachers tell us this problem of violence in our schools has been going on for years prior to the pandemic closures. They say that the school system has not adequately addressed these behaviors, which is why it's worse now. 
Your own staff tell me that incidents are swept under the rug, so there's lack of documentation because that might put you on a watch list or might decrease enrollment and have financial consequences. This is a dangerous cop-out. Children deserve to be safe in school. They deserve an environment that's stable so they can concentrate on learning. Speaking of learning, Mr. Chaudhary, the state superintendent, put out a statement yesterday. Maryland student scores followed a national declining trend on the 2022 National Assessment of Education Progress, NAEP, continuing a downward trajectory that began in 2013 and worsened during the pandemic. Wait a minute. He said Maryland academic proficiency has been trending down for almost a decade. Why? Since 2015, BCPS has been the only LEA with yearly declines in academic outcomes. Why would families want to move here? Why would teachers want to work here? Have any of these policies contributed to this trajectory? No child left behind, race to the top, common core, no federal, new federal school discipline guidelines. Every Student Succeeds Acts, the 2016 BCPS Grading Report Procedural Manual updated last year. I'm not an education policy expert, just a mom trying to make sense of how our federal, state, and local leadership allowed our schools to fail the majority of kids for almost a decade with no correction. What good is evidence-based practice if you aren't going to follow the evidence? We don't have another minute to wait. We're losing faith in the leadership ability. We're looking at you, our education leadership. What can you do to better serve and educate our kids? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Darren Badillo. Darren Badillo. Good evening. We are here today again sounding the alarm that we have a major problem with the violence here in Baltimore County Schools. I've been here speaking in front of the board over 15 times, whether it's virtually during the pandemic or in person last year and this year. It's not going down, it's escalating. We have children crying out for help and we have upset parents who want to come to the board and speak with you face to face and share their concerns, but you only limit 10 people to come. Uh, the pandemic is over. I'm asking board if you can please open it up, but I'm also going to encourage the board to do like Rod does and Julie. I know you guys are both out in the public engaging with the community. I encourage the rest of the board to do that. I would like to give a brief recap of some incidents that happened so far this past year. Again, the first week of school, a child was shot and murdered on Baltimore County school grounds. Guns found in book bags at Chesapeake High School. Randallstown High School, a gun was found in a child's book bag. In the 20th in Woodlawn, a student was in custody for an altercation with a police officer. Um, we have here on the 28th of September, Perio High School, a juvenile was arrested from a fight. Uh, Stricker Middle School, a child was in an article in the Dundalk Eagle that said he was tasing young girls to try to take advantage of them. Also, we see videos every day posted on social media. Perio High School, we show the video of a girl being swarmed around her family, and she was trying to protect them, and unfortunately, the bully didn't get suspended. She got expelled. Um, we had a rally on October 3rd about the concerns at Perio High School, and then three days later, another student got stabbed there. Towson High School, we see fights of kids getting hit for two to three minutes and nothing being done. Perio High School, another fight a video came up on October 9th. Lansdale High School, we saw the video of the principal being attacked and hit. We see the news articles going on. We see bullying constantly going on. Woodlawn Elementary School, uh, I believe that there was a, uh, a threat. In Lansdale Elementary School, a teacher was stabbed. Um, we see multiple fights at Delaney High School. And then we saw at Grange Elementary School that 11-year-old girl went to go pick her five-year-old five sister up at school and got beat up by a high school student right after school on school grounds. I'm glad that we have leaders acknowledging that there's a problem, but we have more than a problem. It's time to call for a state of emergency in our Baltimore County schools. Our kids are not learning. They can't read or write. Their graduation rate's the same, but the scores are down. That's a big problem. These kids feel like nobody cares about them, and after reading this list, I can understand why. We can no longer push this under the rug. It's the teachers unions, the school boards, the Board of Education. You guys step up and fight for these kids so they don't have to do it for themselves because every child deserves a safe and quality education. Thank you. Our next 
next speaker is Timothy Getzey. And they're here. You guys' volume's low. I was going to say, it, it's hard to hear you guys. I don't know. Just the mics. Anyway. Um, I did not prepare a speech formally, so this would be a little uh, winged, so to speak. Uh, first, I want to... Uh, Billy Burke was up before, gave, uh, talked about the IEP facilitator. So when I was talking to the one in my school earlier this summer, um, she was saying she was taking this position. We thought this was a great thing. My son has uh, special needs, and with having her focus on that while the assistant principal could focus on um, behavioral things, just like what Billy said, was sort of excited about it because she was more of a personal touch. Um, than the assistant principal can because they're so overwhelmed. Well, then, because of staffing issues, she's reassigned to another position in the meantime to fill a void where those IEP facilitators are in school. And it would be great if this could be taken care of because um, maybe that would help the, with the school violence stuff and help start with the elementary. And that brings me to my next point is, um, the last meeting that we had, it seemed some were getting offensive or offended by uh, us parents bringing up school violence. And the issue here is these fights shouldn't be happening. They shouldn't even get to this point. The point of a disciplinary process and procedures is to for students to gain respect for each other and that problem students are either removed or handled or taken care of. Um, the respect between elementary school students it seems to be, I would say, good. That's shown in the data that Dr. Williams released earlier in an email. The cases of aggressive behavior seem to be very minor compared to middle school where, I mean, of course, there's the whole hormone thing and those cause those other issues. But in elementary school, it seems everybody's getting along and then all of a sudden it falls off the wagon and it's like what can we do better here I mean that's all we're asking for is to be better for for in, um, administrators to be incentivized in elementary to promote these positive experiences it seems with some of the reporting specifically with the equity report that uh, emphasis on suspensions or disparities in suspensions, it's like, well, who cares? I mean, if somebody punches somebody else, does it really matter what color their skin is? I don't think it does because you just committed assault. So I just, I don't know why there's such an emphasis for this board on, um, on equity in general. Um, as far as the town hall, there was a comment made by the admin that uh, eight percent of the students are the problem. Well, if you look, that's about just under nine thousand. So, does this school system have enough alternative schools to perform, support that many people? Right, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Clarissa Taylor Jackson. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Board Chair and Board Members. My name is Clarissa Taylor Jackson. I am the President of the Baltimore County Chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. I'm also the President of the Metropolitan Baltimore Council of National Panhellenic Council. I represent thousands of black Greek letter organization members who are in your schools or preparing to be in your schools who also mentor some of your young people who are in your district, also who have people, or either have grown up in this district, have siblings, loved ones, people connected to them in this district. So we have a vested interest in the health and well-being of every single child, every single person impacted in the school system here. And, and I want to add to the conversation here. The discussion that has been had up until this point has been very valuable. Um, and I th count myself lucky to be one of the 10 uh, folks providing comment. The comment that I want to make is we are at the ready and have been to provide support to your students 
to your teachers um, for years now, and we're working to make a more concerted effort to do so. I cannot speak to what isn't or what hasn't been done by this board, but what I can tell you is our members have contributed thousands of their own dollars to your teachers' um, to your teachers' supplies. We have um, donated thousands of volunteer hours to your students. And yet what I'm hearing even this, in this evening is that there still needs to be more. What I am suggesting is that we are working, we are absolutely working and, and want to continue working with um, superintendent to meet the aims of this district and to, at the end of the day, support its children. We need help, though. Um, we don't know half the time where to begin. We go school by school even, um, which it, that works for those particular schools. But what, we, what I'm hearing even now is that there needs to be more support. And so we just need the guidance and the energy and the support to come in and support as we see fit. We will not be able to do everything. We understand that. But again, we have many members who are children of this district and who have a vested interest in making sure that every single child that goes through these doors are supported. And so again, I'm asking, um, because I have the platform to do so, in the ways that make sense, in your chairs, certainly support these teachers, support these parents in the ways that make sense to bring us and other organizations just like us into your rooms so that we can support them, but then also give them the resources that these teachers, these admin, and these parents need to make their kids feel safe. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephanie Foy. Good evening. She's back. You may remember that I'm Stephanie Foy and I was a BCPS teacher for 31 years, retiring in 2014. I spoke to you in March and May about the incorrect insurance premiums being taken from the Maryland state pensions of BCPS retirees due to the November 2020 ransomware attack. A lot has been done and much time has been given by members of the TABCO R steering committee as well as employees here at Greenwood but the saga continues. Premium deductions from my pension were finally corrected beginning in July. As a result, I owe $930.24 for the period of November 21st through June 22, as I added my spouse to my coverage, but the deduction did not change. I still have been told not to pay that amount until everything gets straightened out with VOIA. I hope you know the role that VOIA plays in all of this, as most of the retirees did not until they started receiving letters from them in early September. Dr. Yarbrough and Ms. Anderson's efforts are appreciated, but they do not have the institutional knowledge as to how the antiquated BCPS payroll benefits insurance, etc., systems work, although through this saga they have had a rapid learning curve. Most people who had the knowledge have retired. To run a school system of 20,000 employees, you need the infrastructure to conduct the functions. The day I came to speak with someone about my specific situation in September, walk-in hours were designated as 9.30 to 3, Monday through Friday, there were two employees meeting with retirees. I waited 45 minutes and met in the lunchroom in Building B where the employee had no computer access. She literally had to run up and down between the lunchroom and her office to check on my figures. There were three people waiting to be seen when I left. How can these employees be expected to keep up with their regular work when running back and forth all day? While these employees are doing all the work because of short staffing caused by your lack of support, they cannot respond to retiree concerns in a timely fashion and sometimes not at all. Get them some help. Finally, on October 11th, the TABCO Retired Committee sent a letter on behalf of our members to the Office of the Inspector General. We received this response, which will be appearing in our next member newsletter. And I'm going to paraphrase, but I have a copy for each of you. The Office of the, um, the, Office of the General, I'm sorry, 
Anyway, this office has been contacted by several retired education professionals from the Baltimore County Public School System regarding concerns associated with payroll and benefits stemming from the 2020 ransomware attack. As I said, I have a copy for each of you. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Our next speaker is Muhammad Jamil. Good evening, peace and blessings to all. Okay. 54 years ago, I had a choice to settle in Texas or Florida or Maryland. I did a little research and two years later I made my decision. Many don't know the impact made by Baltimore, not only in the entire USA but also in the world. Most important of all, in my view, the if the British were not defeated in 1814 by the forces at Fort McHenry, there would be no United States today. National Anthem was born here. Some of the top 100 firsts in Baltimore are first U.S. post office system in the U.S., first electric railway locomotive in the world, first black labor union, first stationery store, first professional sports organization in the U.S., first junior chamber of commerce in and Jewish Community Center, the first animal welfare organization, first YMCA building, first public library system with branches, first sugar refinery in the U.S., the first electric refrigerator invented here, first gas light company in the U.S., first commercial ice cream factory in the U.S., portable electric drill, production of Venetian blinds, first Sunday newspaper in U.S., first typesetting machine in the world, first Department of Public Health in U.S., first intensive care unit in shock trauma, first publicly financed vocational school in U.S., first Catholic college for women, first dental college in the world, first teacher's college for women, first city to eliminate streets with hydrogen, first telegraph line in U.S., first, I lost my track. The first state that abolished slavery in its, within its borders. And that's where we are living in right now, is the first Catholic cathedral also established here in the United States. These facts inspired me knowing that Baltimore was the most progressive and not a regressive state to settle. That's where I am today. However, it took about three hours, sometimes twice a month in 34 years of my life to advocate equality of treatment for the Muslim students in BCPS. It is disheartening that I am impelled to continue appearing before you to defend your decision every year since that time. You erase the slate of discrimination, alienation, and marginalization. I appreciate your effort, I appreciate your support, and I hope that you shall continue doing so. And I hope that as a progressive state, we are not going backwards. We are an example to the entire United States of America. Thank you for listening to me, and God bless. Thank you, Mr. Jamil. Our next speaker is Jean Milstein. Good evening. Good evening. At the beginning of every school year, we start the delicate dance of getting to know our students. For someone who works with students receiving special education services, this includes reading and processing their IEPs and 504 plans. Every year, I read documents and suspend expectations because inevitably, the students are more than their documents. Maybe they have trouble sitting still in their seats for more than 10 minutes at a time, but they shine on the football field. 
or they may struggle mightily reading grade level texts, but have sketchbooks full of graphic novel length texts. They work on every day to stay focused and ready to learn. As someone with a non-standard issue brain who works daily with students with brains who are also non-standard issue, I have learned to let go of should. In order for students to succeed, we have to meet them where they are, not where we wish them to be. This has always been the case, but it is important that, remember, that we remember this now more than ever. This world is not an etch-a-sketch. We can't shake it and magically wipe away everything that's happened over the last three years. Our normal baseline estate is gone. It is no more. We can't forget the trauma of the last three years. I am fortunate that my home is my safe space. I have to wonder, though, how true is that for many of our students? How many of our students have lost someone close to them over the last couple of years? How many of them have their lives disrupted by lost jobs and lost income? How many new 504 and IEP documents will we read over the coming months and years that are written to mitigate the effects of long COVID or trauma caused by these losses? This year, I feel like there isn't enough me of me to go around. The pressure to help students learn and thrive is immense, but so too is the pressure to return to some semblance of normal, to catch students up to where they should be academically without taking into account where they are right now. And that's a problem. If curricula pressure teachers to give assessments at various points of time during the year before students have mastered the content within them, then at best we will lose their engagement. And at worst, school ceases to be a safe space. And if students are stressed beyond breaking by what is happening at home and what is happening at school, learning stops. As we move forward out of this crisis, can we please remember that students are more than test scores, deficits, and achievement gaps to be filled. They are not data points. They are developing human beings full of potential and struggle and everything in between. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tony De Cesar. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Tony DeCesar, and I was privileged to be selected as one of only 10 people to speak at the last BCPS school board meeting in a county of 850,000 plus residents, but that's an issue for another day. I will be brief. My message at the last meeting was the growing violence in Baltimore County Public Schools, and since that meeting, I've connected with state delegates, county councilmen, teachers, parents, safety resource officers, and community, community advocates regarding the safety of our schools. The physical and psychological damage to our teachers, students, parents, and bus drivers has reached epidemic proportions in our county. Tonight, outside this building, members of our community united to get the attention of the BCPS leadership to act with a sense of urgency to address the daily violence in our schools. Our school system is in a downward spiral. Rome is burning. What are we going to do? What's the plan? In a few days, Baltimore County residents will cast their votes for members of the school board and their number one priority is school safety. It's not the curriculum, test scores, or which pronoun to use. It's the safety of their loved ones. In the last two weeks, there have been multiple stories in the news and on social media of growing violence in Baltimore County public schools. There have been reports of bullying, multiple fights, and a teacher stabbed with a pencil. But it's the administration's position that school violence is down this year. The first step in finding a solution is admitting there is a problem. And based on the group outside this building tonight, safety is our community's number one concern. This body needs to take a long, hard look at the landscape of what's happening in our schools and make safety their number one priority. We've had shootings, stabbings, students end up in hospitals. What's it gonna take before you act and aggressively correct this issue? Turning a blind eye or setting up a committee is not going to change the direction of our education system. It is said the fish rots from the head down and the deterioration of our schools under this administration cannot be denied. 
It is time for new leadership in the Baltimore County Public School Administration, and Dr. Williams needs to step aside and transition to a leader who will listen to the needs and concerns of the people outside this building. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ruth Getz. Hi, I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, I really didn't know I was going to be able to speak, but first I am on the Baltimore County Republican Central Committee and I am running for Senate in District 11. There's a few issues that are really troublesome for me in the schools with the CRT program and the sexualization education in our children, to our children, which bothers me very much, along with the violence that I am seeing happening. And I just do not see the focus of teaching children our basics, reading, writing, math, history, science, and things like that, I think should be the focus instead of these social issues. and. Um, those are just a few things that I would like to, to um, speak to the board about. So thank you for th this opportunity. Thank you. Our final general public comment speaker is Kendra Brown. Good evening. Hello. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Upsilon Epsilon Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. My name is Kendra Brown and I currently serve as our chapter president. We were chartered here in Baltimore County in 1994 in order to be of service, uplift and empowerment to the Baltimore County community. We continue to be of service to all mankind through our UEO FIRE theme, Friendship, Impact, Refinement and Excellence. And we stand at the ready to assist BCPS in all of its programming. I want to thank the chair, the vice chair, the superintendent, the deputy superintendent, the school board, teachers, staff, parents, and guardians who comprise the classroom and community educational ecosystem for our students. Our youth and communities have so much facing them in this day and age, so we appreciate all that you do to support and enrich them and vow to do our part as a chapter to be a positive tenant of your work. Our organization is an international service organization founded on the campus of Howard University in Washington, D.C. in 1908. We were founded on a mission of five basic tenets that have remained unchanged since our sorority's inception. Our motto in our chapter is uplifting and empowering ourselves, uplifting and empowering others. With over 240 members, we do this in a variety of ways. We are comprised of members covering many professional backgrounds, including teachers, administrative assistants, administrators, professional staff, and Baltimore County public school system um, individuals and parents. We have many parents in our chapter who are a part of BCPS. So we understand the dedication and innovation needed in today's educational um, ecosystem. We've been a part of significant programming with BCPS through many schools, including Halstead Academy, Pinewood Academy, Chadwick Elementary, Pikesville Middle School, Woodlawn Middle School, Pikesville High School, and Perry Hall High School, as well as Randallstown High School. And even at Perry Hall specifically, we were called in when there were concerns uh, with um, girls who were there who weren't seeing eye to eye. And so we came in with our mentoring program at the request of the leadership and have continued that program and vow to continue to do what we are tasked to do to be of service to all mankind in ways that aid and assist our educational ecosystem. Additionally, our new international program, Soaring to Greater Heights of Service and Sisterhood, includes two school-based programs, the Childhood Hunger Initiative Power Pack and the Youth Leadership um, Institute. We also have scholarships as a part of our programming and will ensure that the students of BCPS are always uh, set forth in ensuring that they receive the information. We know that it takes all of us, all of us, to do the work uh, and face the challenges of today, and we are up to the task. So I appreciate the opportunity to share. Thank you.
I now turn it over to Dr. Yarborough. Yes, thank you, Chair Hen. There was a comment made during public comment today that demands immediate response from the administration. There was no murder of any student. Oh, on is your mic on, Dr. Yarborough? Excuse me. Okay, thank How about you. now? Thank you, thank Chair you. Hen. There was a comment made today during public comment that demands the immediate response from administration. There was no murder of any student on BCPS property. Thank you. Thank you. Next is public comment on board policy 1300, use of school facilities. And our first speaker is Sharon Saroff. She's not here. Been told Ms. Saroff is not here. Our next speaker is Lloyd Allen. Good evening. Good evening. 1300. Yes. Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Yarbrough, and members of the board, thank you for your time. I am Lloyd Allen, he, him, special educator in mathematics, speaking as an individual with reference to policy 1300, community relations, use of school facilities. Public schools do not exist in a vacuum, but in the context of the communities that we serve. Public school buildings are civic buildings, and the more positive experiences that students and their families have within school buildings, the more positive students and their families feel about school. Indeed, besides the cooperation facility sharing explicitly recognized within the policy with Baltimore County Department of Recreation and Parks, I would note that on November 8th, we are celebrating the civic holiday of the election day, and having an election day without making use of school buildings would be logistically challenging. It also seems worthwhile to remind Baltimore County government that BCPS and its assets are committed to work as part of the Baltimore County Emergency Operations Plan. See page M3 of that document. I had occasion to review this plan in March of 2020, and although the Cow Palace appeared to have smooth administration, I was surprised that I did not hear about uh, our physical school buildings being used in that particular crisis. You see, schools are almost by definition geographically convenient and familiar to community members. This appears to be part of the basis for the community schools provision of the Kerwin legislation. See Senate Bill 661. Community schools must promote active family and community engagement, expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities, including after school and on weekends, and most importantly for this policy, must have collaborative leadership and practices that empower stakeholders, including community partners. Thinking back to my own informal experiences on school property outside of school hours, I recall learning martial arts in elementary school in the multi-purpose room after school hours, learning stage combat in a classroom after school hours in a class taught by a community partner, as well as informally having my grandfather teach me how to fly a kite on the lower field of the school a few years before my brothers and I launched model rockets from the school parking lot. Schools have relatively large open spaces that are well-maintained and enclosed spaces that are a variety of sizes and are typically ADA compliant. My spouse recalls watching English language movies at the local school in Austria, which gave the family members reminders of home. I wonder whether a community partner might sponsor a synonymous event. It is also in the interest of the school building to be well used in order to be well maintained. Being open evenings and on the weekend gives opportunities for building service workers to demonstrate leadership and move up the ranks. It is vital that we be fully, vi the, the. It is vital that we be fully staffed for this role as well as others. We already have arrangements with community colleges, testing agencies, churches, drivers, ed schools, and cultural organizations to use our facilities, and this is a wonderful thing. Only one question, how long should it take to receive a response for the building use form? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker on 1300 is Bosch Farone. Dr. Farone. Good evening to all. Good evening. Uh, you said 1300, right? Yes. Correct? Correct. Okay. I sent you an email. So I have no concerns about 1300, 3250, or 7110. However, I will take this occasion, 15 seconds, to thank Ms. Rowe, the PRC, and the law office for the efforts they do 
in updating the policies. I would like to speak on the last three when my turn comes in, unless you want me to continue. Um, no, feel free to go ahead with 3250. Okay. Is next. Oh, 3250, I have no issue with it. No issue on 3250? No, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're next on seven. Well, you've signed up to speak to 30, 7110. I have no problem with it. No problem on 7110. We have two other speakers, so if you'd like to stay in your seat, I'll call them. Perfect. Um, Timothy Getz, you've signed up for 7110. Determining needs. Welcome back. I only get a minute 40. Um, Ms. Gover, would you please reset <laughs> Mr. Getsy's time? Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, okay, so this is about educational facility planning, determining, determining needs. Um, really don't have any issues with this except for when you get to paragraph 2C. It says staff shall use an equity lens when making all recommendations regarding educational facilities. So I think the intent of this is that that happens after the fact. However, working in the government, this is the first thing that will happen, meaning that they're going to put the equity lens on first, determine where the planning should be, and then present that. I, I, I think this should be removed. if if. That decision, if you want to do that at the board level and that's your prerogative, so be it. But as far as facility planning and stuff, it should be based on the whole school system and what the needs are as dictated by the whole title of this policy. So my recommendation is to remove on that second page, uh, be lines eight through 10 as written to be added. So it should be stricken from the policy, so that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker on 7110 is Lloyd Allen. <laughs> Come on down. Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Yarbrough, and members of the board, thank you for your time. I am Lloyd Allen, he, him, special educator in mathematics, speaking as an individual with respect to 7110, facilities and construction planning. Planning. I began my career on the third floor of a building without air conditioning. I believe that our population was about 200 students greater than our capacity during final exams in June. I would buy 20 pound bags of ice and put them in front of a fan. It didn't help much. The hallways were crowded, and it was as difficult for students to avoid bumping into each other accidentally as it was easy to misinterpret those accidental bumps. A new building was constructed the following year, and as soon as it was finished, we were again, as I recall, over capacity. I don't know whether it was in seriousness or in jest that it was explained to me that we were not allowed to look to the future, but that we could only build if we were already overcrowded. In light of that, I am excited to see not only current, but also projected demographics of the student population in Roman 2.b.2 as a factor to consider when determining whether and how to build. I have experienced antiquated buildings where one uh, learned which set of electrical outlets to use, hybrid buildings where this wing has air conditioning, but that wing does not, Frankenstein buildings where all of the wings have air conditioning, but from different years and technologies, learning cottages, and state-of-the-art LEED certified buildings. I have experienced the awkwardness of in situ renovation where the classrooms from one part of the building are relocated to learning cottages and there are occasional awkward shutdowns when asbestos is discovered where it doesn't belong, as well as learning cottages in the context of an overcrowded building. But you know that I'm hopelessly optimistic. I wonder what it would look like to be able to use holding schools. That is to say, school buildings that are used for about a year while one school at a time is fully renovated without having students in construction at the same time. To not have the fire alarm periodically tripped because of a welding short during instruction. I know that funds to construct a holding school may not be available during this particular fiscal year. When considering projected demographics, please go out farther than a year. It is never a problem to have too much space. All buildings should be large enough compared to their intended programming that the theater can strictly be a performing space or a learning space for performing arts. Buildings should be large enough that all activities in the library and media center, with the exception of ad hoc reading, studying, and borrowing of books, can be at the least co-planned with rather than imposed upon the media specialist. 
Finally, I wonder what it would look like to plot out on a map the year that each school building was built or most re recently renovated and the ratios of usage to capacity. Maps can be powerful visual representations of data. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have policy 8360, ethics code. Um, Dr. Farron, you're signed up to speak. Thank you very much. Page one, line 36, compensation. Any money or thing of value, or thing of value. My thought that or thing of value is a drastic semi-sentence. Things of value can be interpreted six different ways by lawyers, maybe 12 ways, maybe more. I request that you assess that, and uh, such strictness makes it awkward to give anything in recognition, in good faith, and good gesture to a board member. And it makes a board member um, be reluctant, refuse to accept anything, even a cup of coffee and Panera bread, as an example. Line 13, page 3. It talks about the superintendent being an employee. I really don't understand the rationale. Obviously, he is an employee. So my question to you as a lay person from the outside, if we really clarify in the policy that the superintendent is an employee of BCPS, then we should say the same thing about the central office and make it a confirmation for both. Last but not least, page 3, line 30. Anything of economic value, regardless of form, and I know I stated that, but I think it's mentioned twice. Um, again, I ask you to assess that phraseology. I just think it is drastic and it can be misinterpreted. Thank you very much. Again, I praise the PRC for uh, a difficult job in assessing policies, and uh, thank you all. Thank you. So that was 8360. Um, Mr. Mohammed Jamil is signed up. Uh, I sent an email, uh, Madam Chair, that he would not speak. <coughs> okay. Um, then, Dr. Fern, you're also signed up for the next two. Um, next is public comment on Board Policy 8362, Ethics Code Gifts. 8362 about gifts in page 2, line 28, line 29. Unsolicited gifts of nominal value that do not exceed $20 in cost. All right, you know how long I have been in the school system. $20 has been for a long time. Inflation rate is 3% per year and in the past two years has been like 10% and going up. Uh, so you gave cola to, student, to teachers, you gave raise to different employees. I think $20 is, is just too low. So I suggest make it $40 unless there is a state law against it. And that's my comment about 8362. Okay. Next is public comment on board policy 8363, ethics code conflict of interest prohibited conduct. 8363, page 1, line 8 to 11, shall not participate on behalf of the nine board members um, have a direct monetary impact. Direct monetary impact. So my focus is on the word direct. My thought is money and gifts, etc., are fungible. It can take different forms. So I suggest for the, PR, for the board and the PRC to consider direct and indirect in order to cover going around things. For all the above policies, including this one, um, I'd like you to entertain 
an idea, and I, I hope you listen to me. Um, ethics are really important everywhere, school system and beyond. The educational advisory councils are extension of the board. They are a bridge out of the board. So my thought, if board members have all these ethics policies, I think you need to consider to have ethics policies for the members and coordinator for the educational area councils. It would be modified down, not as drastic as this one, but I think that would be a positive step forward. I wish you considered that. Thank you again. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. This is the first reader for these policies, and for that I call on Ms. Lily Rowe, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I'd like to pull out board policy 1300 so that we can vote on that separate, separately. So uh, members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Board Policy 3250, Non-Instructional Services, Purchasing, Selection of Design and Construction Consultants. Board Policy 7110, Facilities and Construction, Planning, Determining Needs. Board Policy 8360, Internal Board Policies, Ethics Code, Applicability and Definitions. Board Policy 8362, Internal Board Policies, Ethics Code, Gifts and Board Policy 8363, Internal Board Policies, Ethics Code, Conflict of inter Interest, Prohibited conduct. conduct. These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit G. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Board Policies 3250, 7110, 8360, 8362, and 8363? So moved, Hassan. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Um, Madam Chairwoman, I'd yes. like to, so I'd like to make the motion um, that get a motion to um, approve the committee's recommendations for board policy 1300 and then um, amend that motion to add wording to the definition. If that, is that an appropriate parliamentary way to do this? or should I move to change the wording before that? Um, would you like to make your motion, Ms. Rowe? Um, for the wording? What, what is your motion? Oh, so my motion is I move um, to change the definition in section two to include the words parking lots. This is the policy on use of facilities and it would change the definition to say as, as school facilities as used in this policy means Baltimore County Public Schools, BCPS property, land, ground, sites, parking lots, buildings and structures. Okay, would you please put um, your motion in the chat and I'll sure. read it. And as this is coming from committee, I think the motion should be to approve what the committee is bringing forward. And then if Ms. Rowe wants to amend that, that would be the okay. proper way. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Mercedes. And that's what I was asking is if, if we should have the motion to accept the recommendations of the committee and then during discussion for that motion, amend the wording. Sure. Um, may I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Board Policy 1300? Ms. So, Rowe? So moved. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Yes, Ms. Jones? 
Thank you. Um, I know that this policy says um, it's undergirded by our annotated code 7110, which says use of school property for any, for other than school purposes, charges for use and liability. My concern is that any damages that may result from the use, since we are really opening it up to the community, uh, I think that should be reported to the Office of Fac Facilities promptly by the principal or the designee, and all damages should be paid in full by the organization. Uh, I would like to amend that we add that to G6. Okay. So you would, would add that. Sure. Would you please put your motion in the chat? Yes. And uh, my next question is to, uh, it's an operational question, is after the use of facilities is completed, are there custodial staff or somebody from the school facilities that is making sure that the facility is secure? For instance, making sure nobody has hidden any kind of contraband weapons or anything in, in the school building for use later, since we do have a problem with that in our uh, country. So is there any protocol right now in terms of what happens after it's used by an organization? Is there a security check done to make sure it's secure? Sure, thank you. Dr. Yarbrough, is there anyone from facilities that can. Yes, Mr. Dixit and uh, Ms. Becker are both here. Great, thank you. Good, Good evening, evening, Mr. Dixit, Ms. Becker. Uh, my name is Pete Dixit. I'm Executive Director for Facilities Management and Strategic Planning. With me is Ms. Elizabeth Becker, and she's the Director of Facilities Operations. So I want to make sure I got the question right, that do we have, do we clean the building after the use of building? And the answer is yes. Do we do any security check at this, at this time? The answer is no. We do not know if they left any um, uh, weapon in the building. We do not have any means to check that at this point. So that is a concern because we're really, uh, this policy is going to open it up for any political organization to have yes. uh, meetings, any kind of community members could go in there. So I think this policy needs to be fortified with the security because we have children that are using their facilities right after those uh, uh, community organizations. And while I think it's a great thing we're opening up the facilities, we also have to bear in mind that our children should not pay the price for it. So I. I do have the the damages part uh, that they be paid for damages that I put in the chat, Ms. Hen, but uh, I think that there needs to be some kind of uh, something added to the policy to make sure that there is a check done of those facilities. So, so that is one of the concerns that we had raised during the um, committee meeting, that while we support community use, we also want board members to understand that the more we open the building, uh, more infrastructure and support staff is needed to clean the building, uh, especially if there are large gatherings for uh, elected officials, for religious purposes. Uh, we do not have, at this point, uh, the facilities or the support to clean the building, and our concern is if the function is uh, on a Sunday night, then limited staff that we have, uh, uh, and with the high vacancy rate, that is a concern uh, that we might not be able to do what's good for the students. And the same concern is for the security checks. I would leave it to the Department of Security to answer that question, but in my mind, we do not have the staff to go through the detailed security pr procedures before and after. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. So essentially you're telling me that a, a f somebody could use a, the facility on a Sunday night and Monday morning our children come in and there could be something hidden over there, contraband um, band items, and there's going to be no check, no, nobody's going to check on that. So I think that that is a concern, and for that, actually, I, I would like to move that this policy go back to PRC uh, for another look to add that kind of language in there um, to undergird that for security reasons. 
So thank you, Madam Chair. Given that, Port, excuse me, Ms. Rowe. Um, we have two motions on the floor. Um, I was about to ask Ms. Joes if she'd like to um, clarify her motion to amend the motion that's on the floor. Um, I won't be entertaining a third motion until we process the two that are on the floor. So, would you like to withdraw your motion that you um, made to add G6? Or how, how do you want to handle the, the second motion that now is on the floor? Because it's we need to process the first motion. And if you'd like to amend that to amend the motion that's on the floor, would you like to withdraw yours and process the motion that you just made? I would like to process and make the motion I just made. And I believe Ms. Tulowski has a comment. Okay, so first we'll, um, I'll need you to withdraw your motion to add G6. I will withdraw. Okay, we have a motion um, currently on the floor that needs to be processed because it's been made and no second is needed since it's from the committee. And that is to, um, that is Ms. Rowe's motion which she made. So we will need to process that before um, processing your motion. Um, so no second was needed. Is there? So Madam Chair, is there a mechanism um, to pull this? back into committee and just table this motion or if, post if you withdraw if you would like to withdraw your motion miss Rowe, yes i would like to the committee didn't consider the security aspect that miss joe's brings up and um given the motion about parking lots that i think the board would like to consider in committee um i would like to uh, make a motion to move policy 1300 well, back to committee so, so Ms. Rowe, before we enter before issuing another motion, would you please withdraw your motion that's on the floor? Yes, I withdraw the motion to approve this for first reader. Thank you. Given that, I'll turn it back over to Ms. Joes, who made the motion originally to to make her motion to send this to committee, since she had made it first. Sure. I move that this policy go back to committee and. Um, be amended to add security language in there to make our facility secure. Okay, Ms. Rowe, do you second? Thank yes. you. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote? Oh, Ms. Stolowski, you had a comment? No? Okay. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote on the motion to send um, this policy back to um, committee? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. That motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Bersades. Good evening. Good evening. Earlier tonight, the board met in closed session in its quasi-judicial capacity to render decisions in cases HE 23-05 and HE 23-07. Now would be the appropriate time to confirm the action taken in closed session. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's cases HE 2305 and 2307 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present? So moved, Hassan. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. Is there a second? Second, Stelesky. Second, Offerman. Thank you both. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stelesky? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Abstain. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank the you. motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. The next item on the agenda is consideration of a special project request, and for that I call on Dr. Zarchin and Mr. Mustafer. Dr. Sargent. Good evening. Good evening. I am pleased to bring uh, forward to you a request for a outdoor classroom and native plant garden at Sparrows Point High School. Okay. Thank you. 
So this is uh, through the Chesapeake Bay Trust uh, in partnership with Sparrows Point High School. And this would pay for supplies, equipment necessary to install all the outdoor classroom and native plant garden, filter fabric, fabric borders, uh, trees, tree stakes, native plants, rain barrels, uh, et cetera, for the school. Thank you. Board members, any questions? Dr. Hager? Um, who is responsible for maintaining the garden? Once it's in, the school will maintain. In the summer months as well? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Jones? Thank you. So, you know, as an environmentalist, I love this idea. Native plants usually are self-maintaining because they're native to, to Maryland. Um, how can we extend this out to all of our schools and facilities, the raid gardens and uh, native plants, species that attract native birds? I think first step is seeing this through, uh, showing how it's impacting students and student learning and appreciation for the environment. Um, and, and we reach out to the Chesapeake Bay Trust again. Uh, for their support. This is a great opportunity for our students and hopefully it will expand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, board members? A comment on. Thank you. Who is that? Felicia. Ms. Dulowski? Yes, I agree. This is a wonderful opportunity and um, of course getting it started in one school first is the first priority, but I would predict that the students who are engaged with this on a regular basis will have positive outcomes socially, emotionally, academically. So this is really great to see. Thank you. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the privately funded capital project, Beacon of Hope at Sparrows Point High School? Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Mrs. Hassan. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Stoleski? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offer Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. All right, thank, thank you, you very Dr. Sargent. The next item on the agenda is information items, which include the quarter one audit report and the minutes of the September 19th, 2022 Southeast Area Advisory Council meeting. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates and agenda items and agenda setting. First is committee updates. The links to the October committee meetings can be found on board docs under this agenda item. First, the audit committee, Mr. McMillian. Uh. Good evening. Our next meeting is of the audit committee is Tuesday, November 15th from 4.30 to 6 o'clock. So if this topic interests you, please join us. Thank you. Thank you. Budget committee, Mr. Kuhn. The next meeting is November 16th from um, 5.30 to 7. Thank you. Thank you. Building and contracts, Ms. Joes. Thank you. Our next committee meeting will be held on Monday, November 7th. Thank, Thank you. you. Curriculum, Mr. Offerman. Our next meeting will be November 17th at 2 p.m. Thank you. Equity, Ms. Scott. Evening. Our last meeting was on uh, how residency is established and the residency investigation process. Our next equity committee meeting will be Thursday, November 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. Legislative and governmental relations, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, a meeting of the Legislative and Government Relations Committee is uh, being determined um, currently and uh, so we will get information out as soon as that's determined. Thank you. Policy review, Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Our next policy review committee meeting is November 14th. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Next is board member comments and agenda items for future board meetings. And we'll start with Ms. Rowe. Hi, yes. So Delegate Michelle Guyton sent an email to a number of us about a grant that looks to be a very um, 
good way for us to get some money for some community initiative with dealing with uh, drug trafficking and opioid addiction in our school system. And I would just like to, if not see that on the agenda, at least get some confirmation that staff, that they looked at the grant process because to me, looking at it, it looks like an easy $50,000 to help our school system. Um, and the email uh, was sent today at, to a lot of different people, um, including Dr. Williams and our board chair. So I would just like to have that come up at some point. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. And I did get that email today and have not had a chance to review it, but I appreciate Delegate Guyton forwarding that to me and we'll be taking a look at that. Um, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, I just wanna say um, it was wonderful today to attend the Rossville Elementary ribbon cutting, um, and I appreciate the board chair being there to give remarks on behalf of the board, um, and Dr. Williams was there to um, give remarks on behalf of the entire school system. Um, it's just another example of how uh, this board has been asking for the needs of the students and the staff and the communities and not simply accepting uh, a budget that was already sent to us. And because of uh, the initiative and the uh, perseverance of this board, there have been tremendous improvements to facilities throughout the entire county. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that um, and I'm just grateful for the cooperation of so many uh, that it does take to do this incredible work that will last for generations with the improvements, maintenance, uh, replacements, new schools that's happening. Um, next, I would like to say that uh, every person that cares about public schools should be engaged in the election process, uh, become informed. There's nonpartisan uh, places you can go, League of Women Voters, uh, websites and so forth to look for information about candidates um, and particularly for school board members it's a very important uh, very very important issue uh, the other thing i would like to say for agenda items is um, i know that we have done work in our in the past with the board handbook uh, that will help with transition but i think that um, every committee and every um, you know the next steps should be taken to specifically state how we are going to support the transition of new board members. Thank you. Ms. Tulowski? Thank you. And um, it was wonderful to recognize some of the wonderful progress being made, especially the environmental program at the high school. Um, also, I want to recognize all of the community stakeholders that spoke on behalf of offering to provide support to students, but also parents and family members that have concerns about their own children and the schools that their child attends. Um, we are all in this together, and there are wonderful things going on, and obviously there are challenges that we're all facing, and we're all going to continue to do our best to try to make improvements. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Thank you. I would like to wish happy Diwali to everybody who celebrates um, the Festival of Lights. Um, as a agenda item, I would like to add as a follow-up uh, the My View Literacy Program that was being piloted in some schools. Uh, Dr. McComas said she would bring it back to the board October, November. This is a good timeline for us to see uh, how the piloting is going so the board could make a decision. So I would like to add that to the next agenda. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Mr. McMillian. Uh, I hope that staff is prepared to release the northeast and the southeast area overcrowding analysis at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Hahn? Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for coming out. Um, I do want to make a special shout out to those who have been speaking up about school safety. Um, it is a very prevalent issue. It is essential that we are discussing school safety constantly. So I appreciate you coming out and you making it an urgent priority because it is an urgent priority. The students see that, I see that every single day, and I can promise you that, and I can also promise you that students are working to make sure that they are providing for their communities. We are a part of our communities just as parents and teachers and staff members are, and we are ready to show up. So I'm hopeful in the next month or so, um, I will be bringing forth 
a mental health resolution um, built by students and, and hopefully we're able to mitigate school safety and make sure that we are supporting our students' needs through that lens and build upon our students' needs. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Offerman? I'm nothing at this time, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for um, being on this um, board meeting with us. And one of the things I'd like to see is um, a further breakdown of some of the information we received from the equity review that was done specifically in the area of suspensions and absenteeisms, um, breaking down a bit more of that information and um, getting some more details from the administration um, as to how they intend to intercede and stop those um, behaviors. So I wish everyone a good night and thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager. Um, thank you. I also want to mention that the next time we all meet as a group, it will be the day after the election. So um, I know I am going to uh, look into the, the event that Ms. Purcell mentioned, which is the forum with the Area Advisory Councils and the PTA for the Board of Education candidates. Sounds like a great opportunity to hear more from those who are running for important offices. And I just also hope that everyone gets out and votes. Um, and we will maybe know who, uh, who the folks are who will be sitting around this dais next time we meet again. Um, and as far as agenda items, um, I know it's come up a few times, but given that this board only has a few meetings left, um, having an item on early school start times and specifically what's being done to address this issue, given that so many other large school systems have figured it out, I'd love to hear more about what the plan is for that. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Uh, thank you. Um, I have a comment and then um, a few agenda items. First, my comment is, Please vote. Uh, <laughs> that's my first comment. Um, uh, and I have three agenda items. One, I would like ongoing discussions regarding school safety to be um, an item on each agenda item going forward. Uh, number two, discussion of BCPS's results of the National Assessment of Education Progress. It was in the news this week. The fact that the math results um, went in the wrong direction, they went down. For fourth graders, uh, I think close to four points, and eighth graders, nearly eight to 10 points, which is considered an entire um, grade level. Um, and I believe it's the first time the math results have ever gone down in history. And my third agenda item, uh, that I, I would really like to talk about is to understand the impact um, regarding the CD, CDC's latest action of adding COVID-19 vaccine to children's uh, vaccine schedule. Uh, so I want to fully understand how that is going to impact Baltimore County and if the state has to adopt it for it to become part of Baltimore County's policy um, so I believe that's an important topic that needs to be added so that people understand that going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I will also be addressing school safety in my remarks as well. We know, at least intuitively, the connection between school climate and school safety and academic progress of our students. It's no coincidence that in 2013, when our discipline guidance changed that we saw a decline. Um, Mr. Chaudhry reported it this week that that's when academic progress throughout the state took a sharp decline when our discipline guidance changed. That's not coincidental. Um, Ms. Causey mentioned tonight that our um, Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee will be meeting and we heard um, tonight that that committee can take action, can lobby for change. When we set our priorities, school safety is going to be at the top of that list. That's my directive to that committee. And as the new board comes on and that committee takes over, that's going to be my request of them if I'm not on that committee or if I am on that committee to take school safety to be first because there's a lot more that can be done both with the current laws that are in place and with new laws that can be done because we know, educators know, they're begging us, and as leaders, we need 
to be the voice. In Annapolis, we need to be the voice in D.C. We need to be the voice in the county asking for change for our kids, for our educators, because if they aren't safe, no one's learning and we're not doing our jobs. So you, you've been heard loudly and clearly. We have our, our marching orders. We know what needs to be done and we're gonna do it. So thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Stay safe. Our next board meeting is Wednesday, November 9th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned.